just go over some of those things afterwards of what we do in our area stuff. So, oh, Margaret. Anyway, that's a, that was the overall plan for the directors, the administrative niceties in each district and how you work your district is up to you. We just yep. want the on field performance to be standardized in a higher level among the referees than it might have been in the past. The districts, we're not trying to change what you do in terms of administrating the referee pool. We just simply want the referee pool to have better knowledge to work the game because that's their primary focus anyway, just as it should be. I think Sorry. Patrick agrees with that, Gary agrees with that. We talked about that before we got started, but you're right. Yep. And I see, I see we got Keith again tonight. So Keith will put that message up at the end then. Okay, all right. Yeah, Jane and I have been playing tag team. She was going to do it, but then her computer just messed up on her. So I'm back at the helm. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to put up a poll before this ends uh, so everybody can take their attendance. Okay, thanks again for being here tonight. Sure. All right, thanks, Keith. It's uh, two minutes after seven, maybe two and a half. Let's get started. Uh, okay. Dennis Cook is here from District 2 to introduce the presenter tonight, Steve Abbott, who's also from District 2. Everybody stay muted until you have to say something. And then. What happened? Go ahead, Cookie. Okay. Um, welcome uh, to everyone tonight to the uh, Tuesday night meeting. Um, as Bucky had said, if you were on, uh, my name is Dennis Cook. I'm the uh, District 2 um, assigner. We appreciate you guys uh, being on this uh, uh, virtual meeting. Uh, before we start the meeting, what I did want to say was uh, we have Keith from the High School League. Um, at the end of this meeting, he will post something for you to record that you ha have attended this meeting. Uh, I know that on Sunday night at our meeting, some people signed off too early and didn't wait for that post. So if you would be patient until that comes up and at that point in time, uh, you'll fill out your information and your district um, uh, to get credit for tonight's meeting. Um, now um, for tonight's meeting, um, our instructor is uh, Steve Abbott. Um, he's a longtime friend of mine, um, known him for over 40 years. Um, when we played soccer, you know, the soccer ball was still around at the time. Um, we have, during those 40 years, we've coached together. Uh, we've played adult soccer together. And we've refereed plenty of um, soccer games together, USSF high school and college. Um, he's a regional USSF instructor and a regional NISOA assessor. Um, he's been a high school referee for probably 30 years also USSF and college. Um, and we just appreciate him uh, being here tonight and being our instructor tonight. So um, I'll turn over the meeting to him and thank you again for everybody for being here. Thanks Dennis, appreciate that. Back when we played high school, Dennis's uh, team Lower Richland used camouflage nets from Fort Jackson for their nets on the fields. It was quite an experience. Um, we've had a lot of fun since then. I wanted to talk about a, a several key issues this evening um, related to high school soccer. Some of the things that I've seen over the past 30 years that, um, that continue to need work, I think, and that help us um, provide a better service to the high schools, whether it's varsity, JV, or uh, my favorite games, middle school um, these days, as we continue to um, learn the differences between the different games that we referee, as Sky talked about the other night, thank goodness the rules are getting closer and closer. It's, it's become a lot easier, I think, from switch from um, games to games, but you really have to be focused in on what exactly the high school rule book says and how the high school league wants us to referee those matches. So the first thing I wanted to talk about with everybody is the two-man system. Um, I know this varies in different parts of the state, how many games that we do using the dual system. Um, 
I've heard in Charleston, maybe not as much as we do in the Midlands and, and we don't do as much maybe in the upstate, but we will find ourselves in situations where we only have two referees at a match. Um, again, I think for a lot of matches, um, it's adequate. I think, if, I think when, once we get to higher level matches where the speed of the game has increased so much over the past 20, 25 years, the players are better, they're faster, they're more skilled, the tactics are different. Um, it becomes more and more difficult, I think, to control a match, especially at, with um, young adolescents and in this two-man system. So I'm going to talk about some things that the National Federation of High School talks about we should do, and then I'm going to talk about some things that I see or have seen out on the field um, that we can do better to ensure that we do keep the players safe, that we do referee fairly, um, and that the outcome of the game is decided by the players on the field. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about responsibilities, mechanics. Um, a big portion, hopefully, is about the general patterns of movement, some of the things that I've seen and some of the things that we can improve upon to make sure we are in the right place to make the right call. And then some of the responsibilities of those two officials that we'll, we'll refer to as lead and trail. This presentation came out of the 1415 um, rule book. And I'll talk a little bit about how that's changed over the past five years, but not really significantly. Just one major change in this year's rule book I'll talk about. And I'm not sure how I feel about it, but we'll, we'll definitely talk about what's going on there. So again, we talk about the head referee and then the other referee. Um, most important thing to do is make sure that you are meeting before the game, um, talking about your responsibilities, conducting a pregame conference with each other, just like you would if you were doing the diagnosis system of control. Um, know that the head referee will make decisions on points not covered by the rules. They are the match authority on rules, interpretation, equipment, legality. The Probably the, I would say close to a thousand games I've done in high school, um, more than half of which were the two man system. Maybe one time I've had to um, act as the head referee and make a decision that I disagree with my fellow referee on. So it's not, it's not usual, but again, you need to know that if it does arise for some reason that the head referee has that authority and his authority would um, outweigh um, the other referee. Typically, um, in the Midlands, you'll be assigned as the head referee, typically the person with the most experience. Um, but again, make sure you know who that is. Again, you're going to get to the field. The rule book says at least 15 minutes prior to the match. You know, we're saying at least 30, hopefully 45. There's just a lot of stuff that you have to do, obviously, when you go out on the field. And part of it with the two-man system is being very clear on who has that authority. Again, as a team, we're going to inspect the field, the players together. We're going to figure out which way our left and right lead trail directions are going to be. 100% of the time, to me, it's been the same. Um, we'll talk about touchline, goal line responsibilities, and we'll show that in a minute. You know, the, again, if you've been doing this a long time, you're probably familiar with the basics. But I know we have at least one person on here that's said that they're a new referee. And they probably, even if they've done USSF, they've probably never done a two man, right, Mike? <laughs> um, so, you know, that's a, a good time to talk to Mike and hopefully he'll do some preseason games as well. Um, use your experience to tell him what, you know, the best way to do that is, okay? As in all refereeing we do, um, emphasize the importance of eye contact, um, consult with each other as needed. You know, the, the biggest problem with the two man system is you've got two different sets of eyes and two different whistles, okay? And as you know, if you've done these games long enough, you often have two different perspectives on any given situation that could be different um, depending on your angle, depending how close you are um, and, and other things that might be going on on the field. Again, you know, guys that I've worked with, you know, Dennis and I did hundreds of games together. We really, you know, we were on the same page. Um, he was my mentor. We knew the, you know, what we were going to call. Um, you know, there are referees that referee differently. Okay, there's 80 people on this call. We probably have 80 different referee styles. Um, 
and what you need to do is talk talk about what that is. So if I'm if I'm going to work a Mac match with Mike, brand new official, you know I'm going to talk about probably I'm going to you know let him know what I think is important out there. Um, I'm going to let him know depending on the type of match how I will go about calling that match, whether it's you know this is a really tough contest. This is Wando versus Irmo. Okay, this is going to be a boys match. You know, we've got to be right on top of things. Okay, we can't let this game get out of control. We're going to maybe start a little bit tight to begin with and then loosen up if we can. In another match, I might say, hey, let's just see if we can let these folks play and um, let the game dictate how we're going to referee. So those are types of conversations that you're going to want to have with your partner, especially if you haven't worked with them before. Okay, I think that's the important thing is to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, just as in USSF, we don't want people making different calls, looking at the same play, okay? We don't want one referee pointing one way, one referee pointing the other way. Um, we don't want one referee, referee saying, hey, that's a foul, the other saying that's something else. So we wanna um, make sure, that's my dog, he gets excited. Um, we just want to make sure we're on the same page. Again, that's going to show the teams out there that we know what we're doing, that we're consistent, okay, and that we have control of that match. The best case scenario is as the dual system is we, we do have simultaneous whistles when the ball's in the middle of the field, and we're actually right on those fouls. We're right on the misconduct, and we're doing everything together, okay? Um, and then looking at coordination issues. A lot of times our games, we're going to have substitute. We're going to have teams on opposite sides of the field. Okay. And with the two man system, well, even with a one man system, I think that causes some problems in terms of substitutes. We're always having to look behind us. We've got two different referees dealing with two different sets of substitutes. So we need to, again, talk about what that's going to look like. You know, hopefully helping each other out over, you know, if a referee is in a position where he can't see substitutes are coming on, I'm going to want to blow my whistle and let the other referee know, hey, you've got substitutes behind you. Let's get them in, okay? And we'll talk about the substitutes procedure later on in this session today. Um, looking at injuries, um, Scott talked a lot about um, making sure you know who the trainers are. We do that before the match. Hopefully you're both gonna talk over, you're gonna talk to those two teams. You're gonna figure out who the trainers are for the home team. If the away team has a trainer, you're gonna wanna make sure that that happens, or if there's just a home trainer, they're gonna be the ones coming on um, the field to look at injuries. Again, all this stuff needs to be handled prior to the match um, in order for when it happens, you're ready for it. You're not looking at each other um, like a couple of idiots. Okay. Uh, and then restarts is important. Again, Bob Curry is gonna do a whole session on restarts. Um, and I'll show some slides here with the trail official, how they're gonna handle that, how the lead official handle those things. Talk about that, okay? Just have those conversations prior to the, to the match. So when you get into the match, you know, we're running as a smooth team as much as we can. So this is a basic um, principles of who's responsible for restarts. Um, the trail whistle always um, starts for kickoffs, goal kicks, throw in on your side. Um, lead whistles typically start in the corner kicks, penalty kicks. Free kicks in their area, I would say, um, and then throw-ins on your side. There's a question mark by drop ball. Um, again, there was a discussion about this in Sky's presentation. Um, I think you're going to get differing opinions on this. I'm very much in the camp of you don't blow your whistle on a drop ball because I'm not really sure what you're signaling. But you know, if you feel like you have to, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and then no. If again, if you've got substitutes coming in from both sides of the field, know who's going to be responsible for that restart whistle. Okay, so it could be a throw in on the opposite side of the field that the subs are coming in on. It's going to probably be a restart, the referee that's closest to those subs. Again, have those conversations. Make sure that you know what you're doing um, prior to that match. And again, for you new folks, Mike, 
um, you know, the more that you do this, the more you're going to get comfortable doing it. And again, hopefully you'll do some um, pregame, uh, some scrimmages and, and get um, get some practice on the field. Again, that's how you become better at doing this. Again, can never overstate um, eye contact and communication. Um, the referee who sees the violation whistles. If you both see it, hopefully you're seeing the same thing. Um, you're both whistling. But again, I'm going to have this conversation in my pregame. Okay, I'm going to say, you know, whoever's closest, let's blow the whistle. But if I'm 80 yards away and I see something egregious that my other referee doesn't see because maybe they're focused on offside at the time, I'm not going to, I'm going to make sure that you don't get your feelings hurt because I blow a whistle that might be 75 yards away to prevent something worse from happening. I might be preventing misconduct. Um, I might have seen, you know, something behind the back of the referee. We just got to make sure we get it right. But typically, the referee that's closer to the play, and we'll see what that looks like on some of these diagrams, is the one who's going to blow the whistle. And again, the best case scenario, the best way that you look as a team is, um, is when you're blowing the whistle at the same time and you're making the same call. I will say, um, again, over 30 years, um, schools want three officials on the field. They, they know, coaches know that that is the best system. Okay. Unfortunately, here in the Midlands and in other parts of the state, we do not have enough referees to cover all the matches. Okay. So we know going in, and I think the coaches, especially at the higher levels, know going in that there are some problems with the two man system, the dual system. Okay. What we need to do is work our hardest so that those um, problems, those areas that may cause some issues, aren't as egregious as they could be. And that we're doing the best job we can. So in the most basic um, responsibilities in the two-man system, as you can see, this is typically the diagonal that we run. Um, you are responsible in your half of the field or your quadrant. Um, the lead official here has the out of touch responsibilities and the goal line responsibilities. The other referee has the other touch line and his to her goal line. Okay, pretty basic, right? This person right here, your lead official is going to be the closest to judge whether the ball is in and out, whether it goes over the goal line. However, unlike in a three-man system, that lead official or the trail official are hardly ever in a position where they're calling the ball in and out of touch, in and out of the goal line, okay? Because of other responsibilities that we'll talk about, okay? Where the game is actually um, in play and flowing on different parts of the field, you're taking positions that often aren't hopefully hugging the touch line or hugging the goal line or hugging midfield or, or any other kind of line. So th that's the problem, okay? Because you've got two basic responsibilities that we used to split Okay, between a referee and an assistant referee, you're now doing both of those jobs. And again, as the game gets faster, the players are stronger, the tactics are different, it becomes more and more difficult to make sure that you get that off side decision correct, but that you also deal with fouls and misconduct, okay, in a way, again, that's fair and keeps the game. Going. That's the hard part, okay. Um, you know, this just gives some examples of keeping the play between the 30 and 40 yard rope. I don't even know what that means, but I've never seen a rope on a soccer field. But, um, as you can see on the left side of the field, the lead official is near the penalty area, okay, where the action is going to happen, okay? This player A has the ball right in front of the trail official. But notice how far into the attacking half of the field the trail official is, okay, in this instance on the left side of the field here where the action is. Um, too many times I see this trail official hanging out around midfield, okay? Looking at offside maybe, or just thinking that, hey, this lead official has that half of the field, okay? We don't wanna see that, okay? What we wanna see is in this diagram, you've got play between the two officials in a manner where these officials are not interfering with play, but they're going to be close enough to make those critical calls. Okay. And so the lead official has 
a really good set of eyes in the penalty area. The trail official has a whole different viewpoint looking in that penalty area. And the trail official also can deal with those counterattacks, okay? So they're not totally um, down into the penalty area because, again, the, the game, the tactics that we see, um, you're going to have to make quick adjustments and quick transitions so you can stay with that offside and catch the stuff that might go on um, with tactical fouls and, and things like that. Bucky, how are we doing in the chat box? You're muted, I think. We all right? All right. Again, this kind of reiterates the fact that um, this is kind of your area of motion as, a, as an official in the two-man system. To do this well, I would make the argument that you almost have to be in better shape than you are either running a referee in a diagonal system control or an assistant referee, okay? Your work rate has to be higher, okay? If you see this area of um, your pattern here, you're going to have to get to the goal line when you need to get to the goal line. You're going to have to get to the touch line when you need to get to the touch line. You're going to have to get to the penalty area on this left-hand side here or this right side side here when the situation calls for it, okay? A lot of times I'm right here in the middle of the field when the play is down in the other penalty area. Getting that different angle of view, helping out my lead referee with anything that's going on. And again, a lot of this depends on the match. Okay, is it a difficult match? Is it a match where both teams play very direct? Do both teams knock the ball around? A lot of midfield play, you might not be moving as much. Um, and again, as you get into the match, you'll, try, you'll probably figure out pretty quickly what kind of um, area of movement you're gonna have to have for that match. But believe me, um, with the way the game has progressed in the past 30 years, certainly or 40 years, whoa, 45 years since I played in high school. Um, it's, you know, the level is just incredible. Okay, the talent of these people, how far they can kick the ball. You know, you got people that can drive the ball 70 yards. You got goalkeepers that can um, punt the ball 80 yards. You know, those are some pretty big sprints. Um, you have to be fit. You have to have a, a high work rate to get where you need to be again. Um, safety of the players is our number one concern, okay? In all soccer games, but especially, you know, the high school league, the age of those athletes, um, the coaches, the athletic directors in the high school league wants us to keep those players safe. Um, just some examples. Um, if the ball is going down into the, the corner, this coffin corner where the ball is here, um, and you've got the lead official over here, this lead official could be 40, 50, 60 yards away from that coffin corner, right? Depending on the width of the field. I don't see trail officials getting down there enough, okay? Because what you have going on here, this is a goal scoring opportunity, right? You've got these attackers that are in a position to possibly score a goal, okay? So you've got defenders who are trying to prevent that, okay? So this is an area that can be very volatile. Okay, you've got people, you've got defenders that are might be too aggressive. You've got attackers that are looking at different things. So um, this trail official, again, is 30 to 40 yards into that lead official's area, helping them out. And again, what we're doing is we're keeping the ball between us. So we have two sets of eyes um, and two different angles where we can see things happening. Again, you've got a lot of stuff that could go on there. The ball could be crossed, the shot could be taken. So that lead official might need to be on the goal line. Um, and then always thinking that, oh, if this defender gets the ball, I'm all of a sudden 80 yards away from my own goal. You know, that's the time I might need to think about sprinting, think about um, anticipating play um, more and more. Um, again, from my experience working with referees, especially um, Referees that aren't familiar with the system, you're going to be moving a lot. Okay, you're not stopping at midfield. Okay, you don't have half of the field. The other official doesn't have half of the field. Okay, we're going to we're going to get in the position that we need to get in, in order to cover play as best we can. 
Um, just like in the diagonal system, the lead referee should be closer to the goal than the thrower in order to cover goal scored as well as offside. Um, so they're talking about the lead official over here. You see where the throw-in is? This lead official has to be, even with a second to last defender in these situations, although in a throw-in, there's no offside, um, but you're still gonna have to be there just in case there's another touch. And again, you've got the trail official is encroaching into the lead, lead official's area a good 20, 30 yards to help out with whatever happens next, okay? Again, the two-man system, you're hardly ever stacked. OK, there are times when you're a referee in a dual in a diagonal system of control where you might be able to take a little break, take a breather. Um, you're always thinking in the dual system where you're going to be next. What's going to happen next? How can I help my fellow official make a call somewhere? OK, again, as a lead official down here. Again, I if this ball, if it's a big throw, you ever been done a game at Brooklyn Casey? They score 50% of their goals on throw-ins because they always, for some reason, train somebody who can throw it 60 yards, okay? So if I'm this lead official, I'm looking for that, but I also have help here with the trail official thinking about what might happen, okay? Those are the type of situations you just need to think about. And again, you might be running off the field. Again, in this position, the lead official is probably on the touchline or even off the field, making sure the throw is legal, looking at offside, um, you got a bunch of different things to go on. Looking at play near the goal. Um, if you look at the lead official here, the trail officials in good position in both these instances, I think they're, they're helping out a lot. Um, what this slide, slide is showing you is that if you're the lead official and you're that close to the goal, you are compromising the offside decision, right? There's no way in this picture that the lead official is even with the second to last defender. Does everybody see that? Um, but I find myself in this position in the dual system a lot, okay? Because again, these are situations where goals can be scored. There are situations where the defense is extra vigilant. Um, you've got the goalkeeper coming out, um, you know, putting himself in a vulnerable position. So these positions that they're showing here on the slide, I think are very frequently I find myself in to make sure that we get the call right. Okay, I could easily, as this lead official, be on the touchline, even with a second to last defender, okay? But again, I put myself in a situation if the field's 75 yards wide, but I'm 30 or 40 yards away from play, okay? Whereas if I'm here on that goal line, I can get a much better view of the stuff that goes on um, in that penalty area. And if you've watched any TV, any high level soccer games, that's where all the, you know, the big stuff happens. The big pushes, the big holds, um, the big um, simulations and all that stuff that you need to be near. So, um, you know, think about experimenting with that if you haven't done it in the past. Think about getting away from the touchline in situations like this and getting closer to the goal line. I'll talk a little bit about where you should be on certain set positions. Um, start a play during play, some free kicks um, and stuff. We'll go over some of that. Typically in the start of play, this is how things look. The trail official, again, is going to be one who's going to blow the whistle. The lead official is going to be either with the second last defender in the defending team or in a position where they can um, help the trail official um, depending on where play goes. You know, again, 90% of kickoffs now are going backwards. So the lead official just has to be aware of what might happen next. But you're going to, again, you're going to be in your half of the field somewhere, either with the second to last defender or maybe closer, um, depending on what's happening. And you'll, you'll know that, again, after play starts. During play, again, we're going to keep play between us. At the um, field on the left, you'll see this player has the black ball here. Trail official is right there with them. Lead official, I'm not sure if that's the best position to be. I'd probably be with the second to last defender right there, a little outside the penalty area. Um, but again, notice how play is between the two, two referees. 
okay, and, and the trailing referee is in the attacking half of the field. The lead referee is pinching in because there's no attackers on the other side of him, right? If there was an attacker on the right wing, that lead referee would probably be wider, okay? But since the attackers are all pinched in, it gives that room for the lead official to pinch in as well so they can help with anything that goes on there. Free kicks, if you look at the diagram on the right, um, you know, again, good position. The lead official is down there with the second last defender now. The trail official is pinching in, um, even with the ball right now. Could probably even pinch in more, because more than likely A is going to serve that ball into the penalty area. Um, but again, they might also be looking at um, making sure that defender doesn't encroach. Okay, so again, there's some different things that you can look at. With the whole notion of those referees being proactive, anticipating where a play is going to go, and helping each other out as much as they can. Um, free kick and the attacking half. Again, just some general principles here. The trail referee moves even with the ball, looks at placement of the ball, encroachment, any kind of delaying of the restart. Um, the trail official on his free kicks does have the whistle. Um, make sure that your, um, if it's ceremonial especially, make sure that your lead official is in a proper position, okay? Um, the lead referee obviously moves either with a second or last defender, more than likely, or um, goal, no goal, depending on how far away it is and where the defenders and attackers are. Um, might be more difficult, was what this slide's saying, if they choose to take a quick restart, it might be more difficult for that lead official to get where they need to be. But again, that's where we anticipate play and start moving, you know, as soon as that trail referee blew that whistle for that foul, we're moving and we're getting into position, okay? So we know where we are. Um, I would 100% um, of the time mirror my um, official's signals. So if the trailing official is giving the indirect free kick signal, I'm giving the indirect free kick signal as well. Okay, we want everybody on that field to know that this is an indirect free kick. Corner kick. Um, this is one of the changes in the rule book on page 88. Okay. Um, for a corner kick on the trail official side, this diagram is correct. Okay. The lead official is going to take a position um, closer to the goal. Our book now tells us a change on a corner kick from the lead official side. They want us off the field in the corner now, okay, judging offside and judging goal from there. Um, for years, I've done both, depending on the match, depending on how they're taking kicks, um, depending on the time of the match, depending on the intensity of the match. Um, I feel that if it's important for me, even if, the, even if that kick is on my side, that I need to be in here looking at what's going on with the goalkeeper and the attackers and all that stuff, I'll move in there, okay? Um, but, you know, again, the book says they want us outside the field looking at goal line, looking at offside. So, again, experiment with that. Um, do what you feel comfortable with, okay? Um, goalkeeper clearance. Mostly what they're looking at here, I think, is that lead official needs to be aware of the drop zone, okay? Oftentimes, this trail official is not going to be in the penalty area there, okay? Um, they're going to be moving upfield as well because, again, these goalkeepers are hitting the ball 50, 60, 70, 80 yards. Um, you've got to get on your horse, and you've got to get in position to help if you're the trail official. You're not going to stand in there seeing if the goalkeeper typically – is stepping out of the penalty area to take a kick. Um, I'll say typically, you know, it might happen, but we got more important things to worry about, I think. Okay. And I'll ask for questions after we're done some of this stuff if you have any questions. Um, goal kick, again, the same issue. Um, you know, with the rule change with the goal kick not having to come out of the penalty area anymore, um, the trail officials' responsibility to make sure it gets out of the penalty area. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, we do have to make sure that the attackers are outside the penalty area. 
um, before the ball is played. But again, you probably now as a trail official, you're probably going to be hanging around the, the penalty area more on goal kicks. Um, it'll be interesting to see how high schools play this. Um, you know, typically what I've seen in high schools is they're typically their goal kicks, they're kicking at 40, 50, 60 yards. Um, we'll see how coaching goes in terms of um, distribu distribution on goal kicks. Um, and then again, that'll dictate where you are. Again, if they're taking if they're taking goal kicks 60, 70 yards, that trail official is going to be away from that penalty area. If they're playing it short, you're going to be right there. You're not going to move. Okay. And your lead official has to adjust as well to that. Okay. They've got to adjust to whether they're going to be at midfield or they're going to hang, you know, closer to the penalty area to see what happens. Okay. Um, again, you know see what that game, see what that match dictates on how you're going to play that. And again, you might talk a little bit about that in the pregame as well. Um, penalty kicks, your trail official is going to blow the whistle and look for encroachment. Your lead official is going to be the goal judge and look at goalkeeper movement. Um, probably not that close to the goal is in this diagram. Um, you know, probably more toward the edge of the penalty area, I would think. I wouldn't want to distract the goalkeeper. Um, but again, this is your basic uh, lineup for penalty kicks. Throw-ins. Um, again, typically the trail official is going to be behind the throw, um, maybe off the field of play. You know, I say typically, it really, again, it depends on what's happening, what part of the field it's in, how um, teams use throw-ins as restarts. Um, you know, do they play it short? Do they play it quick? Um, where are you going to be? Again, it's, it's looking at the flow of the game. It's determining as play is playing what's happening in terms of where you need to be. Um, again, if this... Diagram on the left, if this guy's going to throw the ball 60 yards down that touchline, as a trail official, I'm not going to be where this shows it, okay? I'm probably going to be off the field of play, way in front of that throw in, okay? Again, beat official is going to be 75 yards away from anything going down that sideline, right? So I need to help him out, um, again, depending on what's happening with that throw in. Um, this diagram on the right, um, I'm not really sure what, why the lead official is standing right there where he is. I probably wouldn't be in that situation, um, unless I knew that that throw in was going to go into the goal area. Um, but most teams play their throw ins down the line. Um, so again, you know, think about that. One of the things we don't want to do, and we shouldn't really do in the two man system we shouldn't really be in the middle of play, okay? Um, because that's really not our job. With two officials and two whistles, I think you have a better chance to keep away from play um, and not get hit by the ball. My opinion, see how it happens. Um, drop ball, trail official typically controls the drop ball, lead official into space play. Um, you know, this diagram is outdated, obviously, because now we just drop the ball to one person and the defending, whoever had the ball last, and the defending team has to be four yards away. So this diagram is not correct. But I think the, um, the points here are the same, um, although direction of play is probably not going to change as quickly because the team does have possession. But again, always be ready anticipate what's going to happen um, in this situation, okay? And again, the Federation high school rules seem to indicate there's a restart whistle on drop balls. You know, this says don't, I say don't, but again, if you feel comfortable doing that, it's not that big of a deal, okay? Um, I could get into philosophical arguments about that, but I won't. Um, so we talked about a lot of different situations about the basic philosophy, about the pregame, about um, situations that you might get into and where you should stand. So I'm going to stop sharing that and we're going to open up the chat box 
No, I don't. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box and I'll take a quick breather. <coughs> One of the questions uh, we have that you probably can answer better than anybody else is uh, you downloaded your slides from the NFHS website? Is that correct? I don't know, but probably yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, somebody I mean, wants to know how they could get copies. We have posted the video on the SEHSL website. Keith has done that for us. The, yes, or you can, you can email me and I'll gladly send them to you. I don't know, I can't remember when I got them. I've used them several times over the years. Okay. So email Steve and he can send you the package as the answer to that question. Yep. Um, Jack Kovaleski wanted you to talk a little bit about pregame. And um, we've done a good job of highlighting some things, but just reemphasize um, who's really responsible for inspecting the players. Um, and that's how the referee fits into that. And who's really responsible for coming to the pregame conference on the team side, which is the head coach, which sometimes becomes an interesting challenge. Um, anything else you think about that we ought to be looking at, say rosters or something like that? Just a real quick rundown on the things you think are important in the pregame, especially in a two-man system, if you do, if you would. Well, I mean, you know, the, again, I think it's important that everybody reads this rule book and gets familiar with what it says. Um, the pregame clearly states that the head coach must attend, okay? I think, you know, if we're consistent with that, I think we can make it happen. Um, I have been very guilty of letting an assistant coach come to the pregame, okay? In the past, I have. Um, and, and the problem I think that the high school league doesn't understand is how scripted warmups are for teams. Okay. That they are doing very specific things. Okay. Back when I played and I played against Dennis in the seventies, we'd walk out on the field. Our stretching would be walking out on the field. Okay. We never warmed up. You know, we got to the field, we took a few shots, we went out there and played. These teams are getting out there 30, 40 minutes of, ahead of time <clears throat> excuse me they've got pre um conditioned routines that they go through every time that the head coach is very much a part of okay phil savitz from irmo six-time state championship coach he doesn't want to get away from his players warm up okay if he's playing a game against wanda or anybody but if i'm respectful and say coach you know i need you to come to the to the pregame, he'll do it, okay? Well, he knows he knows this rule book. You know, that's the other thing that we've learned over the past several years is 99% of the coaches read this thing now, okay? Back when I first started refereeing, the referees were pretty much the only people who knew the rules, okay? Um, coaches are now getting referees to come talk to their players about the rules. I've done that on numerous occasions to teams in the Midlands. The coaches are asking me, Come, you know, talk to me about the rules and I'll do that. OK, so they know. OK, um, so you've got to know more. OK, you've got to be the one who is the absolute um, expert on what's going on here. So, again, I wouldn't make it a big deal. OK, I might ask, um, you know, can I get the head coach here? That's what the rule book says. And typically, how long is the pregame? OK, you talk about three different things, right? Um, are your players properly equipped? Um, they are, the coach is responsible for that, okay? We check players before the match, but oftentimes when we check players, they don't even have their shin guards on, right? If we're walking around the field before the match, some players warm up without shin guards, which is fine, right? They might not have their jerseys on. Um, so we're not gonna actually see the final product when they go to the sideline, they play the national anthem, they step onto the field, that is the coach's responsibility and they need to know that. Um, and there are sanctions for that, okay? So they need to know that. Um, I'll, I was gonna talk a little bit later about um, rosters. You gotta make sure you get them, okay? Before the match and that they have the names and the numbers on there and any bench personnel, okay? Which becomes important because 
you have some schools that, you know, the principal might walk up or the athletic director or a teacher, and all of a sudden they're the ones that are yelling at you, okay? They're the ones that are giving you a hard time. They're the ones that are dissenting every call you make. Well, they if they're not on the roster, they shouldn't be there. And if they are on the roster, we can deal with it, okay? So just make sure, you know, you talk about some things like that. Again, I think 75% of the games, 80% of the games, you don't have to worry about that stuff. But when you do have to worry about it, you know, that's when you need to know what you need to do, okay? Um, the head referee in a two-man system is responsible for player equipment, responsible for the balls, um, responsible for the field. Again, we didn't, we, I don't know if we've talked about this yet, but goals must be anchored, okay? That's the first thing I do when I step on any field in our state. Um, when I was a state referee administrator here in South Carolina, every single year, somebody died from a goal falling on them. Every single year when I was a state referee administrator, okay? It never happened in our state, right? But every year I would hear that would happen, whether it's a, an eight-year-old, an adult, whatever, okay? So we do not let that happen, okay? We make sure those goals are anchored. And you're the one who decides that, okay? That game does not get started. Um, a couple things about pregame is prior to the match starting, the home school has discretion about whether um, that game will be played because of conditions. Once that game starts, it's you as the referee. Okay. Now, if I'm doing a two-man system or a three-man system, my referee team is going to help me out, checking players, checking the field, checking the balls, and all that stuff. Okay. Um, but you are ultimately responsible as a referee, except for that equipment issue. Once the game starts, um, you're going to want to make sure the coaches know that that's their responsibility. Um, okay, that's that's great, uh, Wayne. Pavlicek will have uh, some of that when he goes through a game sequence in week four. So, uh, can we go on to another issue that was brought up by someone who was on the last meeting, and we talked about um, what is the uh, restart for a goalkeeper double touching the ball on a goal kick? and denying a goal scoring opportunity and yeah we, we had a long discussion about this and um again high school okay if you read this rule book it's very specific about this issue and we actually thanks to sky and a big discussion we had he actually checked with nfhs to make sure we were right is that um in high school you can't have a denying a goal scoring opportunity unless it's a direct free kick foul okay so what we would treat that as is a double touch, an indirect free kick to the opposing team. Um, the only difference to that is if the goalkeeper came out and cleared somebody out and touched the ball a second time, then that's going to be a foul. OK, but if it's the, the um, incidence is just a double touch, according to the high school league rule book, that's just going to be an indirect free kick to the opposing team. And it could be the goalkeeper, it could be a, a defender. It could be the exact same situation, right? It's not just the goalkeeper, okay? Um, you know, if you have any questions about that, it, but the rule book's very clear about denying goal scoring opportunity. It has to be a direct free kick foul. Um, what else have we got here? That's uh, really about it. Just uh, wrap that portion up for you. Uh, the restart in that incident, any... Uh, double touch by the keeper um, without regard to the effect it has on play, unless you have serious foul play or something like that, physical contact, violent contact. The restart is going to be an IFK, but there's and there's no sanction under normal playing. There's no Correct. call given for anything unless it's outside the double touch. There's something other than the double touch. It's not part of that in the high school league rule book. We'll have some stuff on that Sky got from the NFHS today. Uh, yep. Get that to the directors tomorrow. Let me see what else we got, Steve. John Cotton asked a question about whistles for goal kick, corner kick. Um, I would probably agree I'm not going to whistle for a goal kick. Corner kick, maybe, um, but not necessarily. So, again, only if a substitute has been made, I think you're, I agree, or you stopped play for something else. Um, good question. It's not necessary. Uh, but the trail official would never blow the whistle for a goal kick, right? That much we know. 
this is supposed to do that. That might be about it for now, right? I don't have anything else. Why is there a whistle for a goal kick, corner kick, unless players stop for subs or otherwise? The, that's on there, and the answer to that is there isn't one required. Those whistles are only for when they're required by play, as you indicated in your question, substitutions and injury stoppage or something like that. Right. And you need a whistle for that restart. Otherwise, it's just a goal kick put the ball somewhere in the goal area, they take the goal, goal kick, the ball's in play when it's kicked and moves. Pretty simple and straightforward. Ref is struck by the ball and no advantage is gained for either team. Do we allow play to continue or go to drop ball? Sky, you had that one the other day, didn't you? I don't recall. Didn't you have referee getting hit by the ball now? Yes, but I think I did have the change of possession. Okay. Yeah. So, um, no advantage gained for either team. I think in my viewpoint, that would be a drop ball because you've actually, you, the team that had the ball is now at a disadvantage. Okay. You may not have given the advantage to somebody else, but you've taken away their possession. So I'm thinking you are dropping the ball. Um, and I understand your question. Um, okay. Can players put tape sweatbands over things on their wrists or tape over earrings? Uh, no. Unless it is medical or religious. Okay. I've had plenty of players come up to me and say, um, I can't take this earring out. Can't take this stud out. Just got my ears pierced. Um, Okay, well, you won't play today then, okay? And we've got to be 100% consistent on this, okay? Um, my, I'll tell one story about this. I'll tell one horror story about that. I was in the middle of a game. Uh, we had checked the players pregame. A girl had a stud earring in her nose, okay? I saw it, um, told her she needed to leave the field. She asked me, well, can I just take it off and give it to you? I opened up my pocket on my shirt and she dropped it in there. Comes to me at halftime and says, where's my earring? I opened my pocket, I had a hole in it, okay? She said, my boyfriend gave me that earring, okay? Just, you know, don't get involved in that stuff is a lesson I learned, okay? Zero tolerance is, is pretty easy, okay? Zero tolerance, any kind of string bracelets, um, any of that junk, they're not playing. Okay, high school league rule is very clear about that. Okay, um, can you question them about if it's religious in nature? Probably, unless it's just absurd, I would say no. Um, one, one thing about religion that's you, you can wear religious stuff, but it's got to be taped underneath the uniform. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think that's the question he's asking. Even if we see that, can you say, well, is what is that? Um, and I would probably say no. Um, you're not going to make a big deal of it unless it's dangerous. Okay. If it's a giant cross or something, you know, that covers their whole chest, you know, I'm probably saying no. But if it's, you know, a small religious medal or um, certainly a um, emergency bracelet or whatever, yeah, they can certainly take that. I wouldn't get into huge discussions about that. Maybe after the match, um, make a report. Um, somebody else can look into it. You know, we're looking at danger here, right? This is the biggest thing. Yeah. I think that covers all the questions. If you want to go ahead, the subs. Yes, uh, sir. Can earring have eyeglasses? There's nothing in the high school league rules that talks about eyeglasses. Um, I've had this conversation with people. Um, it's a safety issue, okay? Um, I would prefer players to have glasses that are safety, but I've never denied a player um, to play with eyeglasses, okay? Um, it's their choice. Um, could it become dangerous? Absolutely. Those glasses that um, Mike's wearing or Sky's wearing, Bucky's wearing, <laughs> I mean, if you got hit in the face with a ball and you had those glasses on, it could definitely cause some damage, right? Yep. Um, 
<laughs> and I think that's the reasoning of some people, but in and of themselves, um, I have never denied a player, okay? Um, Dennis can attest to this fact. I have had people talk to me and ask me if we could have a rule that says my son or daughter can wear glasses when they play because they've had referees that won't let them play. But again, to me, it comes down to the discretion of a referee when you deal with safety. Um, and as somebody put in here, 20 plus years, never asked somebody to take the glasses off. And, I, and I'm in the same, same boat there. Um, there are a couple of more questions that I know uh, we're going to talk about those okay. in week four. Oh, week three. three. Uh, 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 Bob Corian is going to cover drop ball and all those kinds of things. Okay, so we'll move on. You're ready to go on. We'll turn this off. And Okay, cool. We'll come back. We'll have more questions at the end if we need it. Um, we're talking about what kind of subjects we were going to teach um, throughout the state, we were thinking about some things that are markedly different from USSF IFAB rules um, and some of the things that we've seen and that frustrate coaches um, that we miss a lot of times, okay? Um, present company included. Um, and Sky talked a little bit about substitutes the other day and how important that is because it becomes tactical, it becomes situational, and it could make the difference um, in a match. So we've got to make sure that we get it right and that we're consistent as well with what we do. Um, just, just a quick note about players, and I talked about this earlier, make sure that those rosters are collected prior to kickoff, but also know in high school that players can be added after the match has begun. Okay, so you all of a sudden see a goal scored by number 14 who isn't on the roster. Okay, you can go over to the coach and say, Whoa, 14's not on the roster, and you can go and they can go ahead and add that player in. Okay, we don't question them about eligibility or any of that stuff, somebody else deals with that. Um, but they can add players after the match has begun, they can actually add, add coaches and other personnel as well. So let's talk in depth a little bit about substitutions, knowing when they can happen, how many people can enter, and how the, uh, the number if it's restricted. So know that unlimited subs for either team from the bench can only occur after a goal or if, an in, or if there's an injury to a player, okay? Note that you do not want coaches or healthcare professionals running onto the field to deal with what they think are injuries, okay? You need to talk to the healthcare professionals, especially because they don't know as much as coaches that they must not enter that field until they're beckoned on by you, okay? So just make that clear in the pregame as you get there early enough to do that. We've talked about figuring out who those healthcare professionals are. You make sure that they understand that they are not to come on that field until you beckon them on. Um, and again, you're going to be the one assessing that initial injury. Head injury, they're getting on right away. Blood, they're probably getting on right away. Okay, but if it's other things in the normal course of play, a hard tackle, a twisted ankle, whatever the case might be, you're making that decision. You're the one who's going to beckon them on. Because if the referee stops the clock to let that personnel on, that player must leave the field, okay? In high school, that includes the goalkeeper, right? You got to know that, okay? This has been a discussion over the years that I used to get wrong myself, okay? Because again, in USSF, in college, the goalkeeper can stay, okay? Um, and then the other thing about an injured player, if you substitute for an injured player, they may not take the penalty kick when they come in, okay? So unlimited subs for either team for the bench after a goal and with an injured player. That's the most liberal substitution time. After that, it becomes more limited because you can have an unlimited substitutions in these instances, but the players must have checked in, okay? They must be waiting in midfield 
for the taking of a goal kick at the caution from either team, except that the caution player may be replaced from the bench. And if they choose to play short, that caution player may not return until next legal opportunity. A red card for either team, blood when a player has to go off, and when bench personnel is cautioned or disqualified. Okay, so these are situations where the players must have checked in. Okay, you can use your discretion a little bit, especially on goal kicks. Okay, if the ball's all of a sudden 30 yards away from the, at a goal kick is kicked over a fence or into some woods or something, and it's going to be it's going to take time to get that ball back into play. By rule, they must have been checked in. But again, if you're consistent with this, you know it may be okay. But, my, but I caution, I caution you doing that, okay? Because the situation that you end yourself up in is, if you do it in that situation, then the coach is going to want you to do it later on, okay? When the game is one to one and there's two minutes left and he needs to get his player in. Well, you let him in before when he wasn't at the center, okay? Again, what we want here is consistency. And I know at times it might seem easy to let them in. Again, you have to know the rule. Um, and as Dennis used to tell me, you got to know the rules in order to bend them. Okay. But in this case, I would caution you about bending this rule. Okay. Because again, it can get you into situations where you don't want to be in. Um, when coaches think you're favoring one team over another. Um, you let them do it earlier. Now I can't do it. Okay. The team in the possession of the ball may substitute unlimited number of players in a throw in or corner kick. Again, these players must have checked in and they can do unlimited number of players. The team not in possession may substitute if the team in possession chooses to substitute. A substitute becomes the play of record when he or she is beckoned onto the field. Again, Scott talked in depth about this the other day, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that, except to reiterate his point about um, use your common sense. When you beckon them on, they have to come on. But you could choose, based on a coach's um, body language, or his language, I don't want him on during the corner kick. Well, as long as you don't beckon them on, they don't have to come on, okay? But once they're beckoned, they must come on, all right? Um, I think that's important. Um, and I think we all do that. Those of us that refereed a long time, um, we think about tactics, we think about what coaches are trying to do. Um, and high school is about participation. OK, so we don't um, we don't restrict substitutes at all. We want players to play, um, but know that you have control over that, obviously. And again, once they're beckoned onto the field, they become the player of record. So when you're dealing with any kind of misconduct, you need to know that. OK, if a team chooses to play shorthanded for reasons other than misconduct, the substitute may enter at a dead ball. OK. So if you only if you're if you're playing short, you only have 10 players, um, they can enter the dead ball instead of that normal substitution opportunity. It's nice that the rule book has finally addressed this. Um, when a team repeatedly substitutes to waste time, the referee shall stop the clock. Um, and this may also be construed as misconduct. And we've we've dealt with this extensively over the years. Um, with teams that are up, you know, maybe one goal at the end of a match is constantly substituting because the, the law, the rules of the game allow them to substitute. Okay. They do allow them to substitute. But when they, when you see that they're doing it just to waste time, um, you can stop the clock and you can construe that as misconduct. And I don't know if I put it on here. Um, I didn't. You can also, the clock has stopped in the last five minutes of each period, okay, which helps us as well when the team that is winning chooses to substitute. So you've got some tools now 
to manage um, the success of substitution issue that, you know, again, we used to have to, um, to deal with without so much guidance from the rule book. Okay, I think it's become easier. Steve. Yeah. One more thing going back to what you just said regarding the, uh, if they're playing short for any reason at the next stoppage, uh, uh, when the uh, ball is out of play, right? But it's not valid if he if they play short with a yellow card player. Correct. The yellow card player must wait to the next substitution legal substitution opportunity. That is correct. That's the only um, caveat to that. Yep. So if, they, if so, if, he, if somebody gets a yellow card and the team chooses not to substitute that player, they cannot come in at the next dead ball. They can only come in on the next legal substitution opportunity for that team. Okay. So their own throw in a goal kick a goal scored, um, corner kick for their own team, whatever the case might be. Good, good question. Um, and again, you know, again, that whole beckoning issue is, um, you know, use your common sense, okay? We don't wanna get into fights. You know, that's, that's what this stops, the common sense piece. Coach, yes, you have to put, put this player in, I beckoned him on. I don't want him in, I want my six foot six guy to stay in the match right now because we have a corner kick, okay? He scored 27 goals with headers. I'm sorry, coach. You had the guy at midfield. I beckoned him on. He's got to come in. Okay. Just think about the situations. All right. Um, again, having said that, be consistent. Okay. Be consistent. I've gotten into trouble myself allowing referee, allowing substitutes to come in off the bench, but then not allowing it at other times. Okay. Hey, hey, Steve. Careful. Yeah. Hey, it's James. Um, no, one thing that I'll do in a situation like that is I'll look at the coach and say, you want them now? Yeah, right. Yeah. Just, just that one simple yes phrase. No. So it's, yeah, yeah avoid the, the immediate beckoning. I agree. Yeah, that's the thing. Just one simple phrase like that, um, you know, helps. And hopefully, you know, the, I guess it, it might become an issue if, um, depending how far away you are from those, from the coach when those decisions are made too, because sometimes, I might be the trail official beckoning players on from across the field. Again, if my lead official is in the coffin corner, I might be the one controlling those substitutes. So again, you know, let's use our common sense. Talk about that in the pregame. Again, the more you talk about in the pregame, the more you can address these issues that might come up during the match. And again, in my 30 years of doing this, everything has come up one time or another. Um, I'll tell, I'll tell one more story just for the heck of it. On a two-man system, um, I was doing a game with a first-year referee, and I, was, I had both teams next to me. The, go, the ball was on my um, – I was a trail official at the time. Both teams were right on the sideline. I was kind of over there. The ball goes out 30 yards up the touchline. The referee calls a goal kick, okay? And I'm over there, and the coach is saying, what? That was obviously a throw in. It was 30 yards up the touchline, you know, and thankfully I knew the coach and it was like a five nothing game, you know, so I could say, you know, it's okay. We'll work with this guy. Okay. We'll make sure that he knows the difference. Um, and again, that communication with the coaches is important, right? Um, we try to, we don't want to talk too much to them, especially during, you know, prior to the match, but there are some things as James just talked about that we can say, that will alleviate situations that can get us into trouble. Okay. And, it, and it's kind of that, that whole common sense, um, what we used to call law 18 or whatever. How many do we have? 20. Just a little bit to end up about clock management. Um, we've had situations where this has gotten us into trouble in the past. Before you go there, yes, sir. To some substitution stuff. We had a couple of questions. Oh, yep. Um, well, uh, talk about uh, yellow cards for uh, cautioning players who are improperly or illegally equipped. There's some substitution issues around that and who gets a card that people might want to know. Okay, so um, since in the pregame, you've told the coach that they're responsible for having their players properly equipped. At the first instance of a player not being properly equipped, the coach actually gets the caution. Okay, the player must 
leave the field, cannot return until, if it's illegal equipment, they cannot return until their next legal substitution opportunity. If it's improper equipment and they choose to play short, they can come on to the next dead ball. Subsequent cautions for illegal equipment, improper equipment, go to the player, okay? When they first instituted this rule, it used to be coach, coach, and you were out of the match, but now it's first card to the coach, subsequent cards to the players. Okay, there's one other one here that's interesting, and I think it's the difference between FIFA law and high school rules. And the question is, in high school, can a player enter during play? Never. That was easy. I don't think we have any questions about that. Good. <laughs> um, why don't you pick back up before I interrupted? My apologies. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So clock management, um, you know, one of the things I've learned over the years is to meet with the timekeeper prior to every match, okay? It just takes two minutes. Um, you know, sometimes they might even be in a press box, um, you know, try to call them down or get there early enough to go up there. I mean, I've gone, I don't know if you've ever been to River Bluff, it's like a college stadium, but I'll go up there, um, especially the first game of the year, and talk to the timekeeper so we're on the same page, okay? Under, he, he understands, he or she understands when I'm gonna stop the clock, okay? What my singles signals are gonna be to stop and start the clock and my expectations at the end of a period, a half or an overtime, okay? So try to do that. Um, it's gonna be different at every school. You're gonna have people that are very competent, that are soccer people, you're gonna have people that don't know a thing about soccer and they're just gonna hit a button to start the clock, whether it's running down or running up. And then they'll go, you know, talk to their friends, eat a hot dog, do their homework, whatever the case might be. If they have a, a visible clock on the field, we want it to be as close to where it should be as possible, okay? Because again, that gives the players and coaches a signal that they may need to change their tactics, that they know how much time is left. Um, you know, it's important, okay? Know your signals to stop the clock, okay? Know that those hands are up here. Um, know that, have the timekeeper look at you. You gotta get used to doing that, okay? Because I'm gonna talk a little bit. We do not add time in high school, okay? We do not add time. The, the clock is stopped for certain situations, okay? So once you stop the clock for certain things, you don't add time for other things, right? So be aware of that. And also know your signal to start the clock, just in case, okay? We know that it shouldn't start until the ball is kicked and moved, but somebody up there might think it start when you blow the whistle, okay? So just, again, know those signals and use them because it's different, obviously, than USSF. For South Carolina High School League rules, the official time is kept by the referee, okay? So you still have to have a watch, okay? You still need to stop it when it's supposed to be stopped and start it when it's supposed to be stopped, okay? And best practice, the thing that we've been doing for years is when I'm talking to the timekeeper prior to the match, I'm having them turn off the clock at two minutes if it is counting down. Um, we have one school in the Midlands where the clock counts up. Typically they just let it run, okay? So when it hits 40, although my watch still has two minutes left, their clock is still running because they never stop it. I don't know if they still do that or not, but Brooklyn Casey used to do that. Um, doesn't matter to me. They, the players and the coaches and the fans know that the, the time is kept on the field now. However, you know, again, because I think it's important if you do have that visible clock, that if you notice that they failed to stop it during an injury um, or the taking of a penalty kick and, you know, two minutes have gone off, you know, you can certainly communicate with the timekeeper, you know, reset the clock to 23.36. Um, again, that helps, that visual signal helps the coaches, okay? It helps the players. It helps the fans stay involved in the game and know where we are at any given time, okay? Steve, but you've got Steve. the official time 
but you've also got this visible thing that people can see that they go by. Yeah. Steve, um, since I've been here in South Carolina since 2003, we have never stopped the clock for anything. Don't issue the signals or anything. I had a conversation with Charlie this morning and it's a little bit different what you described, but he's gonna let, he's gonna put something out to all the coaches and the schools, the ADs, and let them know that, I don't know how the other districts do it, but we have not been doing that. Uh -huh. And letting them, letting, them, letting them know that we've always been the official timekeepers on the games. Yeah. But in this case, we're gonna start adding some time, not adding, stopping the clock. Right. Uh, under the under normal high school uh, stoppage times, including the sales. Yeah. But that's gonna create, if we don't, if the coaches don't know that, um, we're gonna yeah. get a lot of, a lot of problems but he's gonna let them know yeah that's good because i'm with you because it would vary for me it would vary depending where i was if i knew that the timekeeper knew what they were doing i would have the official clock be the official clock but yeah if i if i had problems with it it would be me i'd tell them to turn it off so yeah now we're going to be consistent i think from what i'm hearing across the state that the official that's right. by the referees. That's yeah right. thanks for verifying that Um, you know, that's pretty much it for the, for the clock management. Um, any other questions we got here? Play, major player, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Just a note about five minutes for stopping the clocks only at the end of the game or the end of the second half or the end of the overtime periods. I don't know if you mentioned that or not, but there's a note here that says that. Um, yes. Everything else, else I think you've covered. So, oh, there was one about braces are legal. I uh, wrote down, I looked it up. You can look uh, the 4-2-1F about altered braces. Altered braces, knee braces are illegal, period. That's all the book says about that. And then it says the legal unaltered braces manufactured may be worn without covering which has changed yeah same as uh, ankle braces yeah you just have to have them covered pretty much the same so if you want to go on to ejections let them run no what oh yes forgot about that um last thing i wanted to talk about was um report writing In my time as a high school referee, I think I've had to write three, maybe, I don't know, not too many. Um, if you've got a red card, um, there is an ejection form on the South Carolina High School League website that you must complete immediately after the match, um, is what I would say. Go home and do it. Do it on your phone right away. If you go to the schsl.org website and you click on sports, you'll hit soccer. And you've got a bunch of links here and it has the ejection form on there. You click on that. And it's gonna ask you some information. It's the same for every sport, which is kind of odd. And I got some, we can have a philosophical discussion about that as well. But you're gonna put your name on there. You're gonna put the date of the contest. I'll just put today for the heck of it. Um, you're always gonna be the official. It's gonna give you three radio buttons, AD coach or official. Um, you're gonna hit the official. You're going to hit our sport. I'll put soccer girls. You're going to put the level. You know, this stuff is pretty easy. You're going to put the teams, um, AC Flora versus Dreer. Who was ejected? Um, you're going to put the player. Player for which team? We'll say Dreer. Name and number, John Doe 13. That stuff's all pretty easy, OK? You're just going to fill that stuff in. You've got to know, they're going to ask you what time, what point in the contest the ejection occurred, okay? In this instance, I put the 37th minute, okay? They want to know when it happened. And the most important part about this is the explanation, okay? This is where, you know, I tell people over the years, just the facts, okay? No opinions. We have, we don't make a determination about what we think should happen to this player. 
what we think they were thinking when this whatever happened occurred. Okay, we just report the facts. Okay, in the 37th minute, player number 13, 143, 13, 4, Trier. Um, committed a um, committed a foul with excessive force in the penalty area and was shown the red card for Serious foul play. Player was disqualified. Um, again, time, incident, specific language that is consistent with the rule book. Okay. Serious foul play is one of the red card offenses. Okay. So that's what they want to hear. And then you just hit submit and it goes to the high school league. Um, if you're doing SKISA games, you can go ahead and just complete this one and the high school league will send it to SKISA, is my understanding. We talked to Mike Fanning about that. Um, no, this year, oddly enough, every red card is a three game suspension. Okay. No matter what it's for. Whatever, whatever, whatever that's worth to you. Okay. Again, I, in my high school career, I think I've given one red card. Okay, for denying a goal scoring opportunity. Um, it's not my job to keep players in the game, but I think if I do my job well um, and manage the game, I can alleviate some of the issues that come up. And I think that re relates directly to my conversation about the two man system. Okay, I think if we go in there early. We're prepared. We have a good pregame. We're physically fit. We cover the field. We have respect for players and coaches. Um, we call fouls when we see them. We keep those games under control. I think it goes a long way to us not having to write these reports. Okay, and we don't have that many. Um, but if you do have them, you must. Um, write this report within 24 hours, my suggestion would be do it immediately. My other suggestion would be to get with your other officials after the game and make sure you have the facts straight, okay? One of the things that we've been seeing more and more in high school soccer are um, videotapes of games, okay? So players, um, I mean, the, the schools have whatever you just did your report on, they've got it on film, okay? So just be aware of that, okay? There have been several times in the past couple of years that the high school league has overturned red cards, okay, from referees, which is fine, okay? That's part of their job. We do our job, they do their job, okay? But just make sure at least when we do um, write those reports, that we have our facts straight, okay? The correct players, right? The time of the match, what you're actually disqualifying them for, okay? Can you disqualify a player for dissent? No, okay? So I don't wanna see a report to the high school league that says in the, 40, in the 37th minute, I disqualified a player for arguing with one of my calls for dissent or arguing vehemently. We, you know, there's no adjectives in there, okay? There's the red card offenses and there's the yellow card offenses. You need to know what they are, okay? And then you need to deal with the player um, misconduct correctly or coach misconduct for that matter. Um, and yes, both referees do carry and issue cards. Um, and yes, as far as we know, that three game suspension is for all red cards, even the second yellow. Um, I would love to have conversations with the high school league about 
the difference between violent conduct and denying a goal scoring opportunity with a handball. Um, but, you know, I guess the decision has been made so far. Any other questions about that? Hey, Steve, this is Jack. Hey, man. Um, Keep in mind, everybody. Not, not everybody in this in this uh, meeting tonight is a is an experienced official. There's a bunch of newbies here, also. Uh, keep in mind that the schools also are required to fill out an ejection report, also, so it so that the high school league office has a comparison about what you said and what they said. It's not only a it's not only a video. It is a written report. Yep. I want you to be careful of. Some of you guys know the, some of you guys know the, uh, know the, know, know the coaches, know the schools, know the athletic directors. Sometimes you might get a call for them. They, they'll be asking you, what did you write up? Don't tell them. Yeah. It, it, they'll try to, you know, maneuver your words around to make their side look better. You know, it's not up to, it's not up to, you shouldn't you shouldn't say anything it says i you know i filed a report uh, you guys file yours and that's all i can do with you in a, in a professional manner yeah that is hap that happens more than one time i'll tell you that right now for sure sure okay yeah, especially if you start doing multiple games with the same coaches you do become familiar with them and sure and in a good way in a good way yes um, absolutely yeah. sorry good, about Jack. That. no good all right so one more here, i'm not sure you're saying and scott authored Arth Banning answered it. All officials must have cards at all times. You want to talk a little bit about the two-man system? Who can show a card, either yellow or red, and who files a report if uh, a disqualification is given? Well, yeah, either official can show a red or a yellow card. Um... The, the question has arisen with me before who writes the report. Um, I typically, um, since I'm typically the most senior referee of all the games I do, I make the other guy do it. Um, but proper protocol would be the person who actually gave the card would write the report. Um, you know, they're, they're the ones that have the first hand knowledge of why they did it. OK. And, you know, the, the interesting situation could arise that the one official gives the yellow card for dissent, and the other official, the lead official, gives the second yellow card for a reckless tackle that leads to a red card. So you've actually got input from both the referees. Um, but again, I would say it's probably the responsibility ultimately of that lead referee to make sure that that report is done done correctly. Um, you know, I'll I've been in you know situations where games that I haven't even been involved in, referees will call me on the way home and ask me how you, how would, how do I word this? Okay. And I'll give them advice. Um, Cause it, it, you know, as Jack said, you've got other people writing this, you know, reports from their view. Okay. But you're the referee. You're the one in charge of this match. You need to put, um, you know, precisely succinctly, you know, what you saw that led to your decision. Okay. Um, and again, knowing what this says, you know, what are those red card offenses? Okay. Good questions. I think that's about all I have. It's 828. Um, we're going to put a, some kind of something up here to show that you attended. So um, we can do that. He's going to do that. Yeah, I'll put that poll up now. It's just going to have a list of numbers one through seven. So when the poll comes up on your screen, just click the district you're in and hit submit. And that's all you have to do. Everybody got that? Click your, there it goes. Steve? Yeah. Last, last time we had the poll, we had the name we had to be here. So some Thank you. What district I am, mate? Yeah, I thought we were going to have the names too. Someone, someone, let me share my screen. I'll just put it up for everybody. What's that? Said so if the administrator could let me share my screen, I'll put it up for everybody here. About what district they're in? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think those are cool. Then supposed to do it. Everybody, Keith. 
that needs to go to all the officials <laughs> to be able to see that. Okay, you can you can share your screen now. I need to share mine. Uh, oh, I got it. Got it. I'll get it. There's your region, guys. So, Keith, we're not taking names right now? Yeah, it does take names. So oh, it does. Okay, vote, great. When you vote, it takes your name. Okay, perfect. So where is the... We can move the screen up a little bit so you can see the bottom ones. And for those that called in, how are you getting Keep their going. names? Keep going up. Okay, I guess you can't hear me. No, we can hear you. So there's some people, Keith, that just called in from a telephone. Um, how, are you, how are we getting their names? Do they need to do something else? Yeah, I tell you, uh, put something in the chat, okay? Just, just yeah. put your name in the chat. Good deal. And if you work two districts? You, you do understand when you call in, there's no chat. You don't have so a chat? So I'll send Dennis an email, and I'll let Dennis know that I'm on the call. Thank okay, you. that's fine. What district I, am I in? Um, I'm with uh, Seneca, Wahala, and all them, and Oconee. That's District 1. District 1. Yeah, and I mistakenly put uh, <laughs> District 6 for Dennis. My bad. That's okay. <laughs> I figured. You have to do games Could, down there now. Williamsburg. Uh, nice. Could you put, put, put the poll back up? No more. So they can it, it's still up. I can't. See, I can't see the poll. You can't see it. All it's I can see is all I can see is the district map. What am I doing wrong? Okay, we'll just uh, stop your screen sharing there and see if it shows back up. How's that, Jack? Can't see it. Hang on a second. User, user error. Do, 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 do. <laughs> uh, if they manage, I will go all the way to Horry County. <laughs> okay, if you're on the call still, did you put it up and you want to go again, Keith? Is that what we're doing? Bucky, what district are you in? Say again. What district are you in? What district are we in? Who, who are you? He's three, he's three Ray. He's three. Hey, Raymond, you're in three. Jack Kovaleski is one, Dennis is two, I'm three. Who's number four? You on? What are you, General? The map was too small. General Taylor is five. I think Rogers is six. Rennix is seven. No. If you know something, tell me. Gary Smith is six. Okay. Another way to fix this is just send an email to your district director saying you were here. Okay, just send an email to your district director saying you attended. If you heard that, you know what to do when you were here. Hey, Bucky, did you get a attendance record for last Thursday's meeting yet? Or Jack, did you get one? No, I, I know that I haven't gotten the-, the Okay, no. I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. No, no, I don't think Jan. I don't think Jan or, or Keith sent it. All right, I'll talk to Jan tomorrow. But thanks. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Good luck this year. Thank you, Steve. Hey, hey, hey Bucky. Hey, Bucky. You want to explain the next set of meetings before we take off? Yeah, I can do that. We did that. Just, real, just, just real quick before you take Next off, guys. Meetings will be Bob Correa on Sunday and Tuesday nights coming up. We'll be talking about. Um, restarts, talking about PKs, kicks on the mark, and overtime. I think some of the conversation and questions you've had today will be answered in more detail in that meeting because the restarts cover a lot of the things that we're, people are asking questions about. Hey, Mark, what's your district? Seven? Seven, yep. Okay, Mark, seven. Okay. Now that next meeting coming up is the 31st, that's Sunday. Sunday the 31st and it'll be the 2nd of February. So that's not just for newbies, that's for everybody, correct? When Jan sends the email announcing 
the new timeout, I send that to all the directors, and y'all just send that to all your players, all your referees. Bucky, is this just a newbies and a less experienced referee meeting, or is this going to be for everybody? At the beginning, only the newbies that need to attend the next one are required to attend. The people who have three years or over are not required to attend week three or week four. But you may. I'm you sorry. Wish. Probably should. Okay. You said you may, though. You yeah. said you don't have to attend, but you may. That's correct. Oh. Not required for three years or more referees to attend the next two weeks. You may attend all. So if you're three years or over you, and you've attended two meetings, one the first week, one the second week, you're good in terms of your requirement with your district director, okay? If you want to attend weeks three and four, one of those sessions each week, you're more than welcome, your input's desired, and all that kind of thing. Does that clarify that? Does that clarify that? <laughs> all good. Are we done? Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Sky. Thank all the directors for all the help. Thank you all for attending. It's a great night. All right. Good Please night. go and have a great day. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Steve. Appreciate it. Good luck, Mike.